Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for being here and participating in today's CISIPP webinar on gravity. Today, we have with us Daniele Vigano, my friend. Danny is currently a postdoc research at the Institute of Space Science in Barcelona, Spain. During the last years, he has been dedicated to the study of magnetic field fields in astrophysics, touching in different topics, those being magnetic field in neutron star, observation in X-ray and theoretical model, modeling pulsars, gamma ray emission, small scale instability yielding MHD turbulence in binary neutron star mergers, 3D simulation of magnetothermal evolution of neutron stars. He got his PhD in physics from the Universidad de Alicante in Spain under the supervision of Pro Professor Jose Pon. Afterward, he moved to the University of Balearic Island, and since 2019, he has been working at the Institute of Space Science, leading one of the work package of the IRC Consolidator Magnet Magnesia with the PI Nanda Rea. So today, we, uh, he will talk about turbulence, dynamo in binary neutron star merger. Go ahead, Danny. Let me unmute. Thank you, Miguel. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for uh, for for listening. Uh, so in this talk, I will try to to explain our contribution in the line of research of um, basically how the magnetic fields behave and what what are the imprints they leave in uh, during the mergers of binary neutron stars. And this is actually is is a teamwork uh, led mostly by Carlos Panenzuela in, uh, in Mallorca, University of Balearic Islands, and the other collaborators, Arica Aguilera, which is the PhD student, and then Federico Carrasco, now in Posta, and Borja Mignano, also in Mallorca. So what I'm going to try to do is to summarize a little bit the last couple of years of, um, of research that, that we have done to try to shed some light on the turbulent dynamo happening during the mergers. And this is one of the most important open issues when we speak about this extreme phenomenon. Of course, this, this field uh, has acquired a, a big importance, especially after the detection of the first event of such a kind, uh, both in the gravitational and electromagnetic domain. So it was August uh, 2017, when the detectors of LIGO saw this signal compatible with the binary neutron star mergers. And then just after 1.7 seconds, uh, the gamma ray satellites detected a short gamma ray burst. These kind of events, short gamma ray bursts, are seen very often usually, like every couple of days on average or so. Uh, and it was theorized since long ago that the they could come from the mergers of binary neutron stars. So this was really the first smoking gun. And uh, actually this event in particular was very, very dim. So it was really less luminous than by two or three orders of magnitude, less than the typical short gamma ray bursts, but it was coincident also, it was compatible with coming from the same direction. So the association is very clear. And then after that, there was a plethora of electromagnetic emission during, uh, let's call it an afterglow, so coming from the same loca location in the sky, there was a detection of radio, infrared, optical, ultraviolet, and X-rays in, in the following weeks or months. And all this was quite amazing because it was compatible with the scenario associated with this phenomenon. So there were predictions that these events can lead to the appearance of a kilonova with emission in optical and infrared, which are associated to the radioactive decay of very heavy elements produced during the collision. So in general, these kind of events are important for a lot of different fields in, uh, in physics. Of course, general relativity, because you can test it, so the, the templates that are expected to come from these events, the internal property of neutron stars, so we don't know how the matter behaves at very dense, uh, in very dense environment, like only neutron stars host, and somehow they leave an imprint in the, in the electromagnetic and gravitational uh, signature of these events. We have production of heavy elements, we have the kilonova uh, and gamma ray burst uh, 
uh, modeling. Uh, we can also say something about possible channels of formation of massive neutron stars or light black holes. So there are a lot of different subfields which are really interesting associated to binary neutron star mergers. And during this, this talk, I will focus especially on the magnetic amplification mechanism. Um, so by that time when this happened, it was clear to, to many of us that probably it was going to be a quite lucky event. This was in August, was actually uh, just a couple of weeks after Virgo entered in, in function and, and the work Virgo and the two detectors uh, in the US working at the same time. And then I say it's lucky because the distance of this event was quite short, only uh, 40 megaparsec. Um, and actually, uh, now we know at least one confirmed event and a few others that could have been candidates, and all of them are much farther away. So first of all, it was a lucky event because it was quite close to us. And then second, probably we were also lucky to get the gamma ray burst because the geometry was quite favorable. At least it was the, the gamma ray burst, which is a very collimated jet, was pointing um, not exactly towards us, but not so far from us. So for sure it was a lucky event and we don't expect with these kind of detectors to detect so many. Uh, so the, and this is, this is what happened. Also. For instance, in the third observation run, we didn't get an event with both gravitational and electromagnetic detection. And this, so the, all the information that we have is important and it has fueled a lot the, also the theoretical modeling behind that. Um, as I said, it was important also because we can have some kind of information about the, the, the behavior under extreme conditions of matter. Mm -hmm. So neutron stars uh, in their core, they host a density which is uh, above the, uh, the nuclear density. And this means that since we don't know exactly the fundamental nuclear forces, we, we don't know the details of the repulsive and attractive um, uh, character of the, of the strong force. So uh, we, we cannot exactly predict what is the equational state. And as a consequence, we cannot predict exactly what is the structure inside the neutron star, and especially the maximum mass that can be supported by a rigidly rotating neutron star. We have a lower limit coming directly from observations of systems containing pulsars. In that case, thanks to the, to the Shapiro delay technique, we have a very precise idea of the masses. And so there are like two or three um, of these objects in which we have uh, objects with two solar masses. So we know that at least the, the maximum mass has to be at least two solar masses, which already excludes uh, a bunch of equation of states that have been proposed uh, in, uh, in nuclear physics theories. But still there are many more. And let's say that indirectly, this event uh, can give some indication of, of what is the upper limit of the maximum mass. So basically assuming that the gamma ray burst was produced during or soon after or, or just before the collapse to a black hole, uh, considering the mass the initial mass is that is something known from the gravitational wave signature. And considering the mass lost in gravitational waves um, radiation, then you can infer uh, what is the maximum supported mass. And this turns out to be, according to many studies uh, done with slightly different approaches, but all of them agree that it's around 2.2. So basically, even though it's a quite indirect estimate, it's the first time that you can really constrain quite well the maximum mass of neutron stars, which means that the number of equation of state surviving this constraint is reduced. So we can, in principle, if we believe to such estimates, we can really uh, improve our knowledge of the fundamental forces uh, in, in the, the strong force in particular. No? So this is just one of the things that, has, uh, that have been really important in the field. I'm trying to give at the beginning some introduction with some uh, different elements to be considered uh, in, in the field. And the other element to to, that I want to focus on is the role of the magnetic field in measures. Um, about this, there is a wonderful review by Riccardo Cholfi that appeared a few months ago in which it really details uh, all the aspects of magnetic fields in binary neutron star in, during the merger and in the post-merger. So 
If you want to have more details, please read it because it's really complete and with a lot of references within. And I will try to summarize in a couple of minutes what, what is the core message. So magnetic fields get amplified during the merger by means of different processes. The first process to kick in is the Kelvin Edmonds instability. This instability is something that we, we can even experience on and off because when you have basically two fluids moving at different velocity and eventually also at different densities if you want, uh, then you have this instability with the appearance of curly structures at the interface of these two fluids. So this is something that you can see sometimes. It's a, it's a quite rare phenomenon, but it's beautiful. You can see it in the clouds. If you look when in Google, there are a lot of images with these clouds with curly shapes, which come from the Kelvin Edmonds instability. It's one of the most famous instabilities in fluid dynamics. And if you have magnetic field, this will trigger that the, the movement of the, flu, of the fluids will generate vortices. And with these small scales, they will have to stretch the line, to twist the line, which means that you are amplifying the magnetic field. Since in these scenarios, also in binary electron star mergers, the, the energy associated to the fluid is much larger than the one stored in the magnetic field, there is a net transfer of energy from the kinetic energy to the magnetic energy. So effectively speaking, you are creating magnetic field, uh, taking energy from the, uh, from the fluid. Now, the point is that in mergers, this Kelvin-Hermans instability cannot be resolved by the current simulations because it, it's supposed to happen at very small scales. Nobody's sure of how small, but we could say below meters. Okay, typically. And this happens at the interface when the, when the two stars are orbiting each other, they collide the first time, and at the interface between the two core, you have a layer that probably has the, the typical length scale of one meter or less. And that's the, so it will be the scale at which the instability will be triggered. Then after, after an initial phase that can last, let's say, tens of milliseconds in which you have this amplification by Kelvin Edmonds, uh, basically you form a disk which will start uh, to, to be more, um, the, the, the disk will, uh, will lose the, the initial quadrupolar structures coming from the two cores, so you will have only one remnant with something which is almost actually symmetric. And this is a perfect condition to amplify on a large scale the magnetic field. Because you have a bulk motion of the fluid, and when you have a fluid with a bulk motion in an electric conductive fluid, which is the case, then again you stretch the line, but this time not on a small scale, but on a very large scale. A similar effect which is related to the, to the differential rotation that you have in the disk, the remnant, is the magnetic rotational instability. So the winding the winding and the magnetic rotation instability are supposed to um, amplify the field and especially to, to order the magnetic field, so to give a large scale structure and not a turbulent one only. Now the importance of having a large scale magnetic field is associated to a number of effects. One of them is that in, in, on the fluid it will have a feedback because it will cause effectively some viscosity that will enhance the, the angular momentum transportation. And this in turn means that we'll have uh, an influence on the fate of the remnant. So the more, this your, uh, your, the more viscosity you have, or effective viscosity, the earlier the, disc, the remnant will collapse to, the, to a black hole if the mass is enough. Then another very important thing is the jet formation. The jet formation, uh, according to the simulations that try to, to follow the, the late stages after the merger, seems to be favored whenever you have a very large and very intense magnetic field. And then there are other kind of issues which are related to this and that touches, the, these issues touch other branches of astrophysics. For instance, this could be a way if, if your remnant doesn't collapse to a black hole because it's not massive enough, then you could have a remnant which is really spinning very fast and uh, it's very magnetic. So it could, ride to, could give rise to a, a millisecond magnetar that is an object, very, a neutron star rapidly spinning uh, and uh, intensely magnetized, which has been proposed to be at the base of a lot of extragalactic uh, uh, events like gamma ray burst, um, 
and uh, fast ready burst and a lot of other different uh, very energetic phenomena okay so this is the general pictures of why we care about magnetic field now as i said before um since the the scales the physical scales are very tiny compared to the domain that you want to solve that maybe is hundreds of kilometers is the typical domain that you want to to simulate in order to have for instance the uh, a complex picture with the emission of gravitational waves uh, basically the the current computational resources are not enough to reach such scales and i think they will not be enough in the in the in the near or middle future right now the most uh, accurate or the most uh, let's say the, the the best resolution for the for such simulations come from the group of of Kiyuchi. And the best one, I think, is 12.5 meters. So it's the best resolution that has been achieved. And that simulation costed, I think, like 60 million of, of hours or something like that. So we are speaking about 10 to the 7 hours, typically. Um, and uh, this has some implication. Now, when you have such long simulation, they're, they're very, very fine. But if, if you are still very far from being able to, to capture the uh, the, the small scale dynamics it means that probably going brute force trying just to improve the resolution the resolution down to meters or less is not feasible it's not feasible not only for the computational cost even assuming that we are going to be more efficient but also for for some more practical limitations for instance when you when you have millions of hours simulations this already costs like thousands of years in terms of electricity in the, in the clusters. No? So if you want to reach to improve two orders of magnitude in the, in the resolution, every time you, you improve a factor two, it's a 16 times more uh, costly, computationally speaking. So it means that you could have expenses of millions of euros potentially if you want to solve just by brute force. Okay, so it's not feasible and also the electricity consumption would become quite important. No? So we have to find a way to uh, if we want to solve this kind of dynamics, we have to find a smarter way to do it. Also, to, to guarantee somehow the reproducibility of the results, because when you have these simulations, these are very fine, but then it's very hard to reproduce them and to see, to check also by other groups, maybe. No? Now, um, in the, the Japanese group shows something in a, in a very nice way for, uh, the, it was a clear example. So in this case, you see on the left top panel and bottom left panel you have two different simulation one is the double of the resolution of the other and uh, you can see in, in color you have the intensity of the magnetic field and you can see how the resolution really allows you to amplify much better the magnetic field uh, in their simulation actually they start with uh, a magnetic field in each star with 10 to the 15 gauss this is a, a very huge value and i'm going to to, to discuss uh, five minutes about the the realistic initial values but this is a choice that sometimes needs to be done just for also for numerical limitations so you need somehow to have a quite large magnetic field um, and it's is a choice which is common to most of these simulations the other way the other approach that that can be taken on let's say on an opposite direction is to let's say to care less about the, the resolution so you run with a quite coarse resolution maybe 200 meters like in this simulation by Ricardo Chorfi, but maybe stretch this simulation instead of for a few milliseconds to hundreds of milliseconds which is a time scale that allows you to follow all the dynamics as to the down to the post-merger phase and it will allow us to see eventually the, the possible formation of a jet now in uh, these these results uh, ricardo has uh, at least a couple of papers uh, with, with these results um, in which he sees the formation of a jet but according to him to some estimation the this jet is not powerful enough to generate a short camera reverse so in this particular initial data in, in this particular setup there is no collapse to a black hole yet after 200 milliseconds there is yet a formation of a jet uh, but apparently it's quite weak so he argues that it's not uh, it's not a feasible engine and actually you need a collapse to a black hole to generate a gamma ray burst this was a strong conclusion after his works and um, 
it's it's also in line with the uh, with the widespread consensus that in order to have a gamma reverse you do need a collapse and if you need a collapse then the, the argument that i told you before about the upper limit on the maximum mass is quite strong so it would need it would mean that we know very well the maximum mass of neutron stars this is so these simulations can really clarify some fundamental questions. However, uh, since these simulations are very long, for what I said before, no, it's the reproduce the results is not that easy. There are also some other uh, simulations which don't exactly agree on these findings. For instance, the one of Mosta, in which they do see a jet formation from a, from a remnant. So what they do is to simulate the post-merger phase starting from a, from the final data of the QG group and putting on top of that some very large scale and intense magnetic field, 10 to the 15 gauss. So their conclusion is that they do see a powerful jet forming under two conditions. First, that the magnetic field has to be intense and large scale. And second is that you have to include neutrino physics because it, the neutrino pressure will help to basically clear the way to the jet to, to be able to uh, come out of the, on, the, on the axis, on the axial direction, and to, and to power eventually the gamma reverse. So just to, to give you an idea, I'm not, I'm not arguing on in favor of one or the other, because the argument is very complex, but just to give you an idea that there are a lot of open issues and they're related with the magnetic field. Now, again, uh, these, in this work as well, they start with a very large scale magnetic field, as I told you. 10 to the 15 Gauss. And usually the argument that is, that is given is that since we are not able to, to follow, to numerically reproduce the Kelvin and Monson stability phase, remember the first phase in which you create magnetic field at small scales, uh, then you can assume that the magnetic field will be very large. This argument, in my opinion, is, is okay if you look at it from a magnetic energy point of view, because maybe you have some energetic some energy stored in the magnetic field of the order typically of 10 to the 50 or 10 to the 51 L. Uh, but it's very different if you have a very large scale magnetic field or if your magnetic energy is all contained in small scales. And this is what I'm going to show you in detail in a while. So uh, the other thing to, to consider is what are actually the typical magnetic fields expected when two neutron stars are going to merge. And for this, we can just look at the, the galactic population of neutron stars. So first of all, uh, neutron stars will merge when they are very old, typically uh, billions of years. So we know um, 10 or 15 uh, systems consisting of double neutron stars. This is a table taken from a recent paper. And actually, you can have a precise estimate of when they will merge. So the earliest, the, the system that will merge the earliest will be in uh, 46 million years, for instance. And this system is already very old. This is just to give you an idea that we have to consider the fact that these systems are very old. And it's, it's very difficult to explain very large magnetic field at this stage, after billions of years. Uh, why? Because magnetic fields decay. Uh, the, the matter inside the neutron stars is highly conductive. Yes, the conductivity is very large, but it's finite. It's not a superconductor, or can be a superconductor in some parts of the neutron star, but in general, there are parts which have some resistivity. So the typical time scale for the decay of the magnetic field is millions of years. It means that at the age of billions of years, you cannot expect the same values that you see in young neutron stars. What, what values we see in young or old neutron stars? This is estimated in a quite accurate way when you look at the timing properties of the known pulsars. So when you detect a pulsar, you see the period, you see just the regular pulsation coming to your telescope, and you can measure the period and the derivative of the period. So you can see how fast the neutron star is spinning and how the rotation is getting longer and longer due to the magnetic to the electromagnetic torque induced by the dipolar field. Okay, so measuring the period and the period derivative gives you an estimate of the magnetic field at the surface, dipolar component of the magnetic field. And by doing that, you can see that there are some young pulsars and young other objects called magnetars that are very magnetic, 10 to the 12, 10 to the 13, up to 10 to the 15 Gauss. 
But if you look at very old objects, then the magnetic fields are much less. Not only that, you have also to consider that the, the neutron stars that we know, that are more or less 3,000, are a, a tiny fraction of the total population in the galaxy. Uh, the total population could be a couple of orders of magnitude more. Uh, and uh, for most of them, the magnetic field probably will be less, just because we are biased observationally to detect uh, the most magnetic ones, because if they are more magnetic, they will emit more energy and it will be easier to detect. So when you look at the old pulsars, which are, for instance, this one on the left bottom part, which are millisecond pulsars that are recycled, in one minute I will explain what that means, they typically have the ones that we know 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9 Gauss, but 100 of them have only upper limits on the field. So probably they are even less than 10 to the 8 Gauss. Okay. These pulsars rotate very fast because they have been recycled. What that means. This has something to do with the evolutionary path of binary systems. So initially, imagine you have a very massive star and another main sequence star. The very massive star will be the first one to evolve because it's more massive, its lifetime is shorter, it will evolve, it will become a giant or a supergiant, and then it will collapse to a neutron star, which is step two. Uh, after some time, and some time depends on the mass of the second companion, could be millions of years or hundreds of millions of years, depending on the mass. After that, also the second star will, will, uh, will finish his fuel, so it will evolve, become a giant, and at that stage, it will start to transfer mass uh, to the pulsar. So around the pulsar, the pulsar will start accreting matter from the companion, and this will spin up the, the pulsar up to milliseconds, which is basically close to the to the to the Kepler limit, to the breakup limit of the of the neutron star. So after that, you will be left with a pulsar which is of the order of millisecond, but it's a pulsar which is very old, so the magnetic field is very weak, and so the derivative, the period derivative, is also very low. This is just to, well, to give you an idea no, of what we know about neutron stars and what we know about magnetic field neutron stars, just to, to give you more an astrophysical uh, overview of what we, we really know. So when they are in the stage three, actually, they are uh, very bright in X-rays. This is because you have an accreting disk, which is very bright, becomes, becomes very hot, and, and this represents actually the, the brightest objects in the galaxy in X-rays, if you don't consider the sun. So in this case, it's difficult to, to have an, an estimate of a magnetic field. You can do it indirectly. And again, the typical upper limits that you have are 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 9 Gauss. Okay. So just these few minutes that I, that I took with this more astrophysical consideration, is the take home message is, OK, when you have a neutron star merger, ideally, you would like to consider realistic values of the magnetic field of the order of 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 7. Or even less. But for sure, not, they cannot be much bigger than 10 to the 9. It's completely unrealistic because those fields would be proper only for young objects. Now, of course, you have numerical limitations, so you cannot put a, a too low magnetic field for numerical reasons, basically. And this is why most people use very large magnetic field. Now, there is also another thing to consider that. Uh, the topology of the magnetic field usually is taken as a dipole. So, you know, in astrophysics, many times we, we since we don't know, um, the com we cannot model exactly the complexity of the systems, we tend to play a little bit the, the, the spherical cows, meaning that we simplify a lot our models. No? And when you want to simplify the magnetic field, you just put a dipole, which is the most simple configuration that you can have. Now, nowadays, we know that. This is probably not the case. First of all, because when you look at the topology of magnetic field in other, other astrophysical objects, the dipole is never there. Uh, you look at the Earth, the planets, the stars that we can reconstruct the magnetic fields, basically none of them has a pure dipole. They are all made also of small structures, so a complex topology. And then recently, by looking at some X-ray data of neutron stars, young and old, we had some uh, strong evidences that indeed such small structures, magnetic small structures that are deviate from a large scale dipole, do exist 
even in very old neutron stars like millisecond pulsars. So this means that also the, the topology that you would expect is not a dipole. And when you when when you see the basically the numerical simulations, we are somehow pushed or forced to put something very simple and very intense from a magnetical point of view, but just remember that it's a strong caveat and it's probably it's very far from reality. Okay, so I, in this introduction, I just try to, to put some pieces, okay, from more, let's say, uh, a general point of view. And now I'm going to, to go to the next step. So. The next step is, okay, we, I said before, uh, we don't want to go just by brute force because we cannot and, uh, uh, in terms of resolution. So let's try to be a little bit more smart. What can we do? Well, uh, first of all, consider that the, um, the magnetic field amplification is, you can consider it as a, as a big uh, game between different actors. The actors are the different kind of, of energies that you have in the system. You have magnetic energy, you have kinetic energy, gravitational energy, internal energy. There is an interchange with some fluxes going, fluxes of energy going from one to the other, or yeah. interchanges. And then you have also different scales. So uh, you have that the magnetic energy can be stored in very large scales or in very small scales. And depending on if the energy tends to go from the large to the small scales or the opposite, you have direct or inverse cascade. The key point for our purpose is, is to consider the dynamo. The dynamo is the mechanism that allows you to transfer energy from the kinetic energy to the magnetic energy. And usually in, uh, in MHT, uh, dynamo is easy uh, to, to work while well, it's, it's, it's more efficient when it happens at small scales. Why? Because you have a conducting fluid, so you have velocity. Sorry, this is my son. <laughs> um, so you have uh, very small scales, uh, so it's quite easier for the fluid to drag the magnetic field, to twist it, to stretch it, and to amplify it. Um, so, the question is, okay, we, it's easy in that way, which is small scales, but then how to transfer to large scale? This is another way to connect with what I, say, what I was saying before. So how to create large scale magnetic field that would be passing from the low, the small scales here of magnetic energy to the large scale. Now, this is a common problem actually to other scenarios that have nothing to do with binary star mergers. For instance, if you want to model the, the turbulence around the wings of a plane, or around the wind turbine, or in solar physics. So whenever you had uh, scales which are very different in size, you face the same problem. So you want to solve a big domain, for instance, the sun, but then you have some dynamics that happen at a very short length scale. And so numerically, you would need a huge number of points. So you cannot do it. You have to do something else. And what is done is to use the large eddy simulations. These are, is a, actually I find, a, well, it's a quite a direct name to, to mean that you simulate the large eddies, so the large vortices or the large movements of the fluid, and you model somehow, so you cannot simulate directly, but you have to, to model what happens at very small scales that you cannot resolve, okay? So in some sense, it's like, you want to, you have a blurred picture, you take a picture out of focus and you want to guess what are the elements uh, of, on what are the fine details in your photo or in your image that you can solve. With the additional problem, this is dynamical. So whatever lies there in the small scales can have also an importance on the large scale. And this is the idea of larger dissimulation. So you simulate what you can simulate at a large scale and then you introduce new terms to simulate the dynamics that happen at small scales and that can have an effect on the large scale as well. Uh, on a, if you want to see it with a different perspective, you can, you can think about the, the resolution as an effective filter of the variables. So you have a, a field which in principle is continuum, 
But of course, in your numerical simulation, you have a discretization of your variables. So that means that you are effectively filtering your equations and you're considering an average value inside your numerical cell and you don't know the details inside that cell, okay? If you have a turbulence, for instance, around the wings of a plane, and maybe your domain is the 20 meters of the, of the wing of the plane, but you know that the, the, the turbulence is up in, at centimeter scales, and for, for your resolution, you cannot achieve that. So you have to say, okay, I simulate down to, let's say, 10 centimeters, and then from within those 10 centimeters, I know that there will be some dynamics going on, and I call them a, a residual. Okay, so you have some residual of the field, which are the structure within your numericals. Now, how this, how this, um, how this subgrid information looks like? That depends on the equation. And basically, you have a loss of information whenever you do a filtering, whenever you have a nonlinear term in your equation. To understand it in a practical way, let's take the simplest nonlinear evolution equation, the Burgers equation. The Burgers equation, you have the derivative of the, of the velocity, and you have the flux, which is the, the, the square of the velocity itself. Now, when you, when you discretize your equation, what you, are, what you are evolving in time is the filtered value of the velocity. So ideally, you would like to have a filtered value of the square of the velocity but you only have the filter value of the velocity. And it's not the same having the square of the average values or the average of the square values. The difference between them represents the loss of information that you have when you filter out, when you filter your equation, okay? And that this, this tau, which is the notation that I will use to indicate these uh, sub-filter or sub-grid tensors is unknown a priori. So you, you cannot know, if you don't simulate it, you cannot know how it looks like. We can scale up in, in complexity. Let's consider the compressible MHD, non-relativistic. So in that case, you have three equations, the energy equation, the induction equation, and the momentum equation. Let's take the non-viscous uh, MHD. Again, you have a lot of non-linear terms, and for each of these terms, you will have associated a kind of residual, which are these six tensors here. Again, uh, you don't know the exact form. So practically speaking, in a numerical simulation, by definition, you are evolving you, what you can resolve and you don't know how much you are losing and what is the shape of these guys here on the right. Okay? So how to model them? Since the 60s, people have tried to come up with some ideas of approximating this loss of information with some functional form that has to be a function only on the evolved variables. Okay? So if you are in a, in a non-relativistic MHD, you would like to have something which is, for instance, as a function of the energy U of the magnetic field B, um, and of the momentum, which is this rho V. Okay. So um, how, how do we know if the model that we choose, imagine we have a functional model, which is a certain function of these uh, conserved variables, how do we know if it really reproduced the reality of the residuals? One way to do it is to consider an a priori test. A priori test, in a very naive way, is you have, a, let's say, you have a very high resolution photo, which would be the one on the left. In this case is a, is a real simulation with a field, but just think about the, a picture. And then you blur out the image. So you, you apply a filter that basically unfocus your image. You take the difference between the two that what is the difference? The difference is within, inside of each pixel, you will have a structure on the left that is lost in the middle. So the difference between the two of them, when you have a nonlinear term, is the loss of information that you have. What you can do is pixel by pixel, look if the functional form that, that you choose to model this loss, of, this loss of information reproduces or not the loss of information that you have when you blur out a high resolution image okay this is saying in a, in a quite naive way uh, it's not exactly this it doesn't complete the picture because it's not uh, dynamic so you just take a, a snapshot and you and you look and you look at that but it's important to know if your model is fitting well the loss of information 
So what you can do is basically to do a, to, to a correlation test between the, in each pixel, the values of the, of the information loss and the value of your model. Now, the classical model that, that was proposed was the, the so-called uh, Smagorinsky model, which is a dissipative model. This is basically uh, an analogy with the viscosity and with the resistivity. So if we are speaking about MHD, you basically introduce an additional term, which is proportional to the strain rate. So it's just exactly like a viscosity term, but with a difference that is proportional to the square of the resolution of your grid. And the same with the induction equation. You basically put a term which is proportional to the, to the current, so exactly like a resistive term, in which the resistivity is a, is a sum coefficient which is proportional to the square of your resolution. This is crucial because when you have this proportionality with the resolution, it means that in the continuum limit, your equation don't change. So this, this subgrid term just disappears if you consider delta going to zero, which is the continuum limit. So it means that the mathematical character of the, of the continuum equation of the analytical equation is exactly the same because in that limit, you're not introducing anything new. It's only when you discretize that you introduce something to account for what you lose when you discretize, okay? So it's a kind actually of a, a, somehow a numerical method to account what you lose in the discretization process. However, when you, when you choose something like this, these are making some strong physical assumption. And in particular, in this case, you are assuming that the only effect that you want to, to mimic or to include is a dissipation, okay? Or a viscosity, resistivity, or means dissipate. So it means that you are taking some energy at small scales and you are converting it, for instance, into heat. So you basically, you, you only can reproduce a direct cascade. If you remember the, the diagram of before, it means that you are reproducing the effect in the system coming from large scale to small scale, but not vice versa. So by definition, for instance, these models are not able to reproduce a dynamo mechanism, so not able to reproduce the transfer from kinetic to magnetic energy, and they are not able also to uh, generate an inverse cascade by construction. However, this can be very useful for other purposes. For instance, these have been generalized in, a, in a GRHD mergers, so without magnetic field, to account effectively the viscous effect that I mentioned before that a magnetic field can have on the remnant. So the actual the effective viscosity that the presence of, magnet, of the magnetic field implies can be accounted somehow via a calibration of the pre coefficient. And this is something, some work that has been done by David Radice and collaborators in the last uh, three years, and also in uh, one paper of, uh, the, uh, of the Japanese uh, group of Shibata Equich. So uh, this is useful now, but maybe not for our purposes because we want to see the dynamo effect. So we cannot use this kind of, uh, of model. So what can we use? Well, yeah. 10 minutes. Okay. So, ten, but it was not, um, okay. I will try to speed up. So you can use some uh, dynamo term, uh, basically introducing by hand a magnetic field. And this, uh, this has been done in the past, but uh, the problem with that is that you have to switch off basically the terms at some point. So it's like a by hand and, and also you are changing the mathematical. So what you can do is to use a gradient model. And the gradient model is, um, you can think about the, the finite resolution as a filter of the conserved equation, as I said before. And for mathematical convenience, you can assume a Gaussian kernel. When you assume that, you can express basically the kernel, and then you can take its Fourier transform, expand in the series of C, which would be the resolution of your read, and then from that, since the average is the convolution of the field, the average field is a convolution of the field with the kernel, you can consider the inverse Fourier transform and you can have an expansion in series of, uh, of powers of C. When you truncate this to the first linear term, then you have the basic recipes whenever you have non-linear terms. And these are the cases here. Uh, so basically you have combination that are the, the filter of products is the product of the filter plus some term that goes proportional to the, to the square of the resolution 
plus combination of the gradients. This is why it's called gradient model. Uh, so when you have a conserved uh, evolution system, you have the same gain, and in conserved uh, variables are function of the primitive variables that are the physical variables that you need. So in this case, the residual are basically the functional of the of the um, of the average primitive variables minus the average of the fluxes. Okay, F are the fluxes here. What you what you can compute is the first one. What you cannot compute is the average of the fluxes. So Federico did uh, uh, here a strong analytical work to, to transfer it to a special and general relativistic case, considering basically two formulations for these terms. So you, have, you can express them as a function of the gradients of the either conserved variables or primitive variables. So um, let me skip this, and I go directly to the, to the special relativistic case. What you have? is that the system actually becomes very complex. So you have uh, terms which are somehow understandable, like this one in equation 48, which are the dot product between the different gradients. But then you have a lot of cumbersome expression coming from the fact that the system of equation is highly nonlinear, and you have a lot of couples between different terms. So these are just to give you an idea. I'm not entering in details, but you can add these kind of terms, considering combination of the gradients of the primitive variables, and this is what you have basically to work out. What we did was do an a priori test that it was, I explained before, and we saw that both in the non-relativistic and special relativistic case, the correlation of these terms is very good. So it means that basically, if you, if you consider a filter of a high resolution case, these terms are able to provide the, the, the correct fit. The thing is that, okay, let's, let's see how, how they work when you really implement in a larger simulation. Uh, this, of course, is not magic, so it means that if you filter too much your equations, so if you consider a filter which really blurs too much your images, then these models have some limitation, cannot reproduce all of the uh, information that you're losing. Uh, when you go to general relativistic case, you have to consider some assumptions and basically that the metric is not turbulent. So you assume somehow that the gradients of the fields, of the MHD fields are much stronger than the gradients of the, of the metric. And it means that uh, you can somehow make the, the gradient operators transparent to the metric, which simplifies a little bit your life and makes the equation looks like the special relativistic case with the addition, of course, of the shift factor of the uh, lapse function whenever they're necessary, but without considering them in the expansion of, of the nonlinear terms. Okay, so we did that, and we performed some upper a posteriori test, which means let's consider if we see the the magnetic amplification using a low resolution implementing these values, which is similar to a case with higher resolution, and this is actually the case. So we did box simulations. We did also with with the other two non-relativistic and special relativistic cases, and we saw that actually we could reproduced a magnetic amplification with a much lower uh, resolution, which means that we are saving a lot of computational time. We have done the same now with the binary neutron star mergers. I'm going to, to, to highlight these results, which are the last paper just accepted by, by Ricardo Aguilera and the rest of us. Uh, we use the platform Symfony, which is an open code, an open platform that automatically generates code and it allows uh, with a modular way to implement any partial differential equation, leaning on the infrastructure summary for adaptive mesh refinement and parallelization. What we did here was to use the CCZ4 formulation for Einstein equation, high order schemes for both Einstein and fluid equations, and then we employed a 10 to the 11 Gauss as initial field, so much lower than the rest uh, of works uh, so far. Uh, the finest resolution we considered was 37 meter, while the lowest one was 147 meter. And we consider either just the low resolution, medium resolution, or high resolution case, or the low resolution with the addiction of the uh, subgrid scale model that I explained before. And the idea is to compare the results in the, with this large eddy simulation case plus a, a subgrid modeling with the medium and high resolution case. So this is the low resolution. 
This is the orbital plane in uh, rainbow colors is the density and with the brownish scale is the magnetic field. Uh, normalized to 10 to the 17 Gauss. You can see in the lower resolution, you have some uh, field approaching locally 10 to the 16 at 10 milliseconds. But when you go to intermediate resolution, you get much, uh, much higher uh, amplification. You go to higher resolution, you even reach locally 10 to the 17 Gauss, starting from 10 to the 11 Gauss. Everything at very small scales. We do start to see some ordering of the magnetic field. So you see, this is again the, the toroidal component in the orbital plane. We can see some ordering of the large scale structure, but still most of the, most of the magnetic power is condensed in a high wave numbers, which means that most of the magnetic amplification happens at, at small scales. So what you have in a, a large scale is a minor fraction of the total energy at least at this stage up to 10 or 15 milliseconds. Now let's consider the one in the middle, which is the large jelly simulation with the addition of a subgrid modeling with activating only the induction equation uh, terms. So the, the subgrid modeling uh, terms only in the induction equation with a pre coefficient, which is eight times higher of what you would expect from the analytical field. And I will come to this at, in the conclusion. So you can see that, especially at five milliseconds, I don't know if in the image you can see it very well, but uh, especially at five milliseconds, which is a central column, you get some results which is much closer to the medium resolution than to the low resolution. So it means that with, uh, with half of resolution, so eight times, uh, 16 times less computational cost, you have results which are very similar. Also in terms of magnetic energy amplification, you can see that the green line here that is providing in the initial phase uh, an amplification which is between the medium and high resolution case using only a low resolution one. Now the point is that in the long run, when you approach to 10 milliseconds, um, this, is, this is what we have to, uh, to, to consider because uh, this effectiveness come to become less evident. And actually you see that you have a kind of saturation. So um, the system is not amplifying as much as the high resolution case, for instance, and it becomes lower than the intermediate case. So somehow this is very effective for the instability part, for the uh, steep amplification part. But when you consider uh, longer uh, times, we have to, to understand what was going on. And related to this is also that when you implement uh, coefficients which are of the same order, so if you put the coefficient 8 also in the subgrid terms in the other two equations, not only in the induction equation, but in the, let's say, in the, in the stress energy tensor equation, the energy equation, then what you have is that uh, your amplification effect uh, is completely lost. And this is probably due to the fact that in the system you have two different scales. And if you set this value to in the, let's say in the, in the matter or in the stress energy uh, tensor equation, uh, you, uh, these kind of subgrid models with high coefficients, somehow you are, uh, you are suppressing the turbulence and you are uh, not providing a good magnetic amplification. Now, this is something that needs to be investigated further. But for sure, for the first milliseconds also at the level of spectra, you can see that when you consider the difference that we have between low, medium, and high resolution, which is the left panel, with dash, you have the magnetic energy, and with the solid line, the kinetic energy, you have a big difference of orders of magnitude in, uh, in amplification of magnetic field. The shape of the spectra is the same. And if you include uh, the subcriter modeling in the induction equation, which is the green line on, on the right, you're able to reproduce basically what you have in the intermediate case using much less computational cost. So the reason for this um, not full understanding of what's going on with the parameters could be solved by, for instance, testing this formalism in other codes or testing also in other phase, in the post-merger phase. Uh, we have some ideas why this is happening. Uh, probably it has also to do with the, with the numerical scheme that you use. So the fact that you use a certain numerical scheme means that you have a certain character in the, in the small scales. So the more dissipative is your numerical scheme, the higher have to be your parameters to counteract dissipation of your scheme. And this is why it would be very useful if somebody else can try to, uh, to get some results like this. 
what what I want to well now right now we are also uh, working on the the other physical part regarding gravitational wave and the ejecta so we want to to see if the subgrid modeling is able to reproduce uh, for instance the, the gravitational wave pattern that you have from higher resolution but let's say that generally speaking the, the, I come to conclusion uh, generally speaking what we know is that for sure we cannot go by brute force to solve the amplification magnetic field in measures. And we have done a, a series of studies starting from non-relativistic to special relativistic to general relativistic um, equations, study the problem in a box simulation when everything is well controlled. And we have done tests a priori and a posteriori proving that actually the formalism is correct and our, uh, our subgrid models are able to mimic the loss of information that we have until a certain depth within your numerical cell. Um, now, this implies that you could save a lot of computational time at least of one order of magnitude. The, the thing to, that we need to understand better, as I said, is this uh, setting of the pre-coefficient. And this means I, I think that more groups have to, have to try to implement and, and study the results that they have. Because also, you know, that the results in this case, for those that work in this field, it's, it's well known that, the, for instance, the fate of the remnant it depends on the resolution that you use. So it's not surprising that also the, um, the, the introduction of this coefficient can cause somehow differences in the fate of the remnant, for instance. No? So there is more work to be done in this direction. And actually, this, in general, this, this formula is, is general. So it can be applied to any turbulence scenarios, not only in mergers. So if you have another scenario in which you have turbulence, you can apply it. And I encourage other people maybe working in this field to try to implement it and to maybe to collaborate in the future. And I, I end up here. And of course, also if my collaborators will have some other things to add, they are most welcome. And I thank you for, for this opportunity. Thanks a lot, Danny, for a very nice talk. So now the round of questions. If there are any questions, go ahead. Feel free. So, <clears throat> hi, nice talk first. Um, so I have a question on the interpretation. Uh, so this gradient method basically computes correction terms that only depend on the gradient of your cell averages. Uh, so if you would compute that uh, for, I mean, if you have uh, infinite resolution and then switch to finite resolution, you can have completely different uh, subgrid uh, situation with exactly the same average quantity. So you get exactly the same correction terms. For example, uh, you could have the same correction term uh, if there is turbulence within the cell or if there is a simple uh, laminar gradient with no turbulence whatsoever. So in principle, there is not a degree of freedom uh, for the turbulence here. Um, so one, to be, if I would want to be negative, I could say, okay, what you have here is a parameter you can tune uh, these uh, coefficients uh, you fit to something so you uh, get an amplification but uh, of course you never know if this is the right parameter um, unless you have the actual solution so uh, <clears throat> but I still find it uh, interesting to have such a parameter to play with because angular momentum transport due to effective viscosity for example is very important as you said and uh, having some way to simulate that or let's say mimic that uh, if it's correct or not is I think very important but maybe you can comment on uh, if my comment was first comment was too negative or if there's a way out of this no no it's uh, it's it's perfectly fine and I, I mean it it's actually the most delicate thing no it's the thing to understand and actually this let, let's call it a, a calibration problem because it's this is something very common to any subgrid scale model and uh, so there are two things to consider. Uh, I agree with what you said, and I will try to complement it a little bit to clarify. So one thing is that uh, 
this this modeling uh, you can see it somehow this is my 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 personal view eh? this is this modeling is not so different from conceptually eh? from somehow reconstructing the fields inside your numerical cells because you are doing somehow for, for the nonlinear terms are uh, a first order approximation of some information that you are losing on, on the structure within the cell. This means that, of course, this has some limitation because you, you cannot dig too much inside the cell because you cannot invent information that you don't have. So you can extrapolate somehow from the gradient of the field, you can extrapolate down to a certain depth. This means that, of course, uh, depends on the, on the resolution that you are using, you will be able to reach down a certain uh, effective resolution or another. You will never be able, of course, to, uh, to mimic the entire loss of information that you have within the cell because it will be magic, no? so it's, uh, that's not possible. And the second thing is that the issue of the calibration, I, I think that if, ideally speaking, you would have a perfect method which is non-dissipative, so somehow we have a very fine, very accurate reconstruction method that doesn't introduce any dissipation at small scales. I think that you should use this price coefficient equal to one because it's what theory says and it's what also we, we proved when we do this a priori test in which we can see the correlation between the loss of information and our model and the best coefficient. And this best coefficient, let me move the screen here, is of the order one, one, 1 1.3, 1 1.4, but it's not eight, okay? But this is just an a priori test in which you're not dynamically evolving the term itself, okay? So when you have a dissipation in your numerical scheme, it means, for instance, that effectively, it's like you have a, an additional term already that partially kills what you are trying to put, okay? So, my interpretation is that we need, in our scheme, which is high order accurate, but still it's a finite difference. So it's, for instance, it's more dissipative in general than a spectral scheme, average speaking. Uh, this means that we have some dissipation at very small scales, and we need to counteract this, this kind of intrinsic dissipation of the method with something more, no? like putting, overshooting a little bit our parameter. This is why I'm saying that it would be very interesting if other groups with other numerical schemes or other implementation test this kind of stuff. We, we can actually test something simplified, no? Some, or even a box simulation, uh, to, to check this, no? because it clearly is the most delicate issue and it's the, a fair criticism that uh, we are the first ones to have. No? Of course, we, we would like to have everything one that works perfectly, so this is completely understandable your objection. So that is, that is a little bit the point. So we hope that maybe using other schemes, we can understand better what about this kind of calibration. More questions? Thanks. Anyone else? Okay, if no one else has a question, maybe I can ask a second one. Uh, <clears throat> that is actually applying to all uh, BNS uh, simulations, not just this scheme. So there's all papers make a big deal about amplifying the field with Kelvin Helmholtz, but uh, it is rarely mentioned how I get uh, any effect from, from this field to where I actually need it, which is above the pole of the final object to make an SGRB. So if, for example, this just vanishes into the black hole, there is no benefit uh, in terms of short gamma ray engine. If I have 10 to the 16 Gauss in the star, but uh, it stays there. Uh, so, <clears throat> uh, of course, there is also some material transport going on, the fluid uh, has a very complicated flow in the uh, early post-merger phase. So if one has a strong seed field somewhere, it could get uh, transported out and then stretched or something. But I think that's all not very well investigated. So can you comment a bit on the relation between what you uh, <clears throat> try to uh, amplify and how this ends up uh, useful for a short gamma burst? 
Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is a little bit uh, basically one of the motivations now because um, th there are some words, for example, by, by most time, which they focus on that basically. And uh, they, they start directly with the post-merger phase uh, with a large scale magnetic field. So here I think that the contribution that we can give, if we are able somehow to improve the knowledge of not only the intensity of the magnetic field, but especially the topology of the magnetic field at the, in the remnant, let's say after 10 or 20 milliseconds, uh, then we, we can have a better idea on, on if and how it's possible to, to create such a large scale, in this case for them it's 10 to the 15 Gauss uh, dipole. No? Of course we cannot create a pure dipole, but let's say some components going into, into dipole. So, of course, the, the winding and the magnetic rotational instability will, will help. We have some hints that also in our simulation that we are seeing the winding starting to order the toroidal field. But it would be interesting now with a kind of more realistic seed in the post Kelvin Edmonds phase to see how the winding and magnetic rotational work with that seed. And that could be done again with, with our modeling. Uh, or with very, very high resolution uh, simulations. And then after that, you, you could see, you could answer if you can really create this, this kind of large scale magnetic field. Because um, the, the, the fact of that one can start in the pre-merger phase with huge magnetic fields dipolar, is not a big problem because the system kind of lose memory of what was before the merger. You have amplification on small scales and it just forgets. So that's not a big deal. But if you start drawing conclusion, uh, applying in the post-merger phase a dipolar field with no turbulence, then I think that the, the conclusion would be different. And I'm not sure that the jet formation will behave in the same way and maybe it will be in general more difficult because it will be not so easy to organize the field but that's to be seen so the idea is to to go to to longer simulations of course with less resolution but using this this modeling okay is there any the last question or Okay, I don't think so. I, I saw something in the chat. I don't know what's. Uh, no, I don't see anything there. Uh, ah, no, no, it was all before. Okay. okay. So, thanks again, Daniele, uh, Virtual Club, and, <laughs> and very nice talk. So, uh, just before everything.